Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. As part of this briefing, we'll have an opportunity for live Q&A with our experts, and we'll be offering these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of your screen. And before I turn to our experts, I want to remind you that the Coronavirus Resource Center recently launched a newsletter called The Week in COVID-19. The newsletter is a great way to get the latest analysis from our experts. It arrives every Monday, and you'll learn about vaccines, variants, and other vital COVID-19 trends. You'll see sign up information for the newsletter in the banner that will appear on your screen during this briefing. Today, I'm joined by two guests. First, Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, who is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Jennifer will give an update on the public health implications of the COVID-19 data. I'm also joined by Dr. Bill Moss, who is the executive director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give an update about COVID-19 vaccines. And I'll now turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Jennifer, first to you, we continue to see troubling trends with cases and now in some places hospitalizations on the rise. Do you think that we're heading into a new phase of the pandemic? Thanks, Lainey. Um, yeah, I mean, we globally uh, are not in a great situation. Um, COVID cases continue to surge across the globe. In the last week, there were many days when the daily case numbers um, among all countries exceeded 800,000. The biggest worry right now is the rapid acceleration of cases in India, which just this week reported more than 200,000 cases on a single day. Um, but we also continue to see high increases in many countries, particularly um, in Latin America. In the United States, the main observation this week is that cases and deaths seem to have plateaued. Cases are up this week by 6% as compared to 10% last week. Um, but we're seeing that 20 states um, are reporting uh, case increases for now um, two or more weeks. And we always look to see, you know, a, a two or more weeks as indication of a potential upward or downward trend. In this case, unfortunately, it appears that there's an upward trend in, in these 20 states. Um, the state that's worst hit by far has been Michigan. Everybody has um, expressed deep concerns about what's happening in Michigan. Cases this week were up another 6%. Um, one potential glimmer of hope there is that um, the 6% increase is lower than what we saw increase last week, which uh, was 23% increase last week. Um, so it's possible, and, and it's my sincere hope, that infections are starting to slow a bit in, in Michigan. Um, but the situation there is, is of course, quite concerning. Uh, after weeks of seeing sustained declines in deaths, um, sorry, sorry, after weeks after seeing sustained declines in test positivity, we're also seeing it tick up nationally. Um, this increase is um, driven really by a substantial increase in test positivity in just a handful of states, though 12 states reports are seeing an uh, increase in test positivity this week. Um, I mentioned deaths um, before. Uh, we are also um, seeing there, um, uh, you know, it's that deaths are down 2% this week, um, but this decline is slower than what we um, have been seeing in uh, for, for weeks prior. And so this is one of the reasons why I think deaths are starting to plateau. Um, it's also being reported that hospitalizations are up in some places and that younger people are more frequently being hospitalized for COVID. And this is frankly something that shouldn't be surprising. As case numbers increase, hospitalizations and deaths um, may also increase. And the fact that we started vaccinating the oldest Americans means that younger Americans are less protected from this virus by the vaccine. So we have to remember that while advanced age may be the biggest risk factor for severe illness, it's not the only risk factor. Um, and so young adults can and still be hospitalized um, with this virus and, and some of them um, may die. 
Um, the plateaus and cases and deaths um, that we're seeing are frankly um, to be expected. As I said, you know, we started vaccinating the oldest adults. I expect that as we continue to expand the administration of vaccine, focusing on other age groups, we will see um, all of our indicators, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths um, decline further. And so it's really important that that work continue as quickly as possible. That said, um, we should not derive confidence from seeing a decline. Our daily case numbers are still dangerously high and the national numbers and even our some of the statewide numbers uh, a plateau at the state or national level can hide some concerning data that may be emerging at the local level. And now we're also hearing about numbers of um, places in the US um, that may be becoming hotspots um, for spread of the virus. Um, this is usually at the county or city level and while the case numbers in these places may not be enough to sort of shift the national needle to see that kind of accelerated increase in cases um, that some have feared we could see, um, it is of course a warning sign because as we know, um, the, the virus can spread from the areas in which they're circulating. So I think we have to um, be quite mindful of this. So again, have to stress, it's really essential that we continue to work as quickly as possible to increase vaccine coverage. Um, but at this point, vaccines are not enough. I mean, all of the public health measures that we've been using for the last year, testing, tracing, isolation and quarantine, masking, avoided crowded, avoiding crowded indoor spaces, these remain essential for slowing the spread of the virus. Our goal here is to protect people long enough to be able to reach them with vaccines. We're getting closer to that point, but we're not there yet. And the weeks and months ahead will be critical. So we have to um, you know, maintain um, vigilance and, and kind of hold the line for a bit longer. Thanks so much, Jennifer. It's, it's certainly a sobering update this week. Before I turn to Bill, I want to remind our audience to please submit questions for our experts in the box at the bottom of your screen. Bill, turning to you, it has been a busy week with a lot of focus on the J&J &J vaccine. What do you see as the key developments of the last few days? Yes, thank you, Lainey. It, and it has been a very busy week, uh, as have the past several weeks uh, in the in the COVID-19 vaccine world. I just want to start off uh, picking up on Jennifer's point that uh, we have made and uh, can, hopefully will continue to make or, or need to continue to make progress in vaccinating Americans. Uh, we, 198 million doses have been administered. We're on track to meet President Biden's goal of 200 million doses uh, by his 100th day in, in, in a presidency. We've vac fully vaccinated about 30% of all adults in the United States, and very importantly, about two-thirds uh, of adults older than 65 years of age, that, that higher risk age group. Um, and as Jennifer said, that's one of the driving uh, reasons why we're seeing more cases in younger individuals. Before I come to the Johnson & Johnson story, I just wanted to uh, pick up on uh, some recent news yesterday when Pfizer's chief, chief executive, Albert Bourla, commented on the, on the likely need for booster doses. Um, and he initially suggested, you know, six to 12 months after the first dose and then perhaps annually. There are a couple of reasons to give additional doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. One is if the, the, our protective immunity wanes over time. Um, but also uh, to help combat uh, emerging variants that may be escaping from the vaccine-induced immunity. And it, this can be done in two ways. You could, we could use the, the same vaccine uh, as a booster dose, increase those neutralizing antibody levels, and that can have some impact on some of the variants. The Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson are also working on newer vaccines that actually include the genetic recipe for the spike protein uh, for some of these newer variants of concern. So there are at least three reasons why additional doses um, may be uh, warranted. I'm I'm not quite as uh, as pessimistic as uh, as Pfizer's chief executive is, although he may have access to data that I don't have. But it's interesting. Just recently, Pfizer uh, released a preliminary analysis of six months of follow up from their phase three trial, suggesting you know continued high level of protective efficacy. And and Moderna uh, released very. Uh, 
recently uh, similar types of data. So we're at least seeing uh, high levels of protective immunity six months out after vaccination. And whether that, uh, that immunity is going to wane quickly over that second six months, I think is still very much unclear. Um, uh, uh, Albert Bourla compared uh, SARS coronavirus 2 to influenza virus, saying it's more similar to influenza than, than polio. Well, it's not quite uh, like influenza, which really has the genetic ability to, to change every year. So I think it's a little premature. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we need um, booster doses at some point, but I think, I don't, I think we don't yet know uh, at this stage uh, in our, our vaccination program uh, how soon or how frequent we would need those booster doses. But the big story over the past week has been the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, as you said, uh, Lainey. And I want to review kind of what we know, what we don't know, and what the implications of this are. So what we know is that out, out of approximately now more than 7 million people who were vaccinated in the United States with the J&J &J vaccine, there were initially six women 18 to 48 years of age who developed a severe clotting disorder along with a low platelet counts, and platelets are uh, part of our body system to, to, clot, uh, to form clots, um, six to 13 days after vaccination. So between one and two weeks after vaccination. And what was striking was that they developed a severe clotting disorder called cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which is uh, clots in the brain. Um, and one one woman died. One was uh, has been severely ill. So this this is a, a something to be taken seriously. But the first point I want to make is that these were detected through our vaccine safety surveillance system, uh, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS. Um, and this is really how we want our safe vaccine safety system to work. So this shows that that system is working. Now, on the basis of these uh, six reports that came to the attention of the CDC and the Food and Drug Administration, uh, the FDA and the CDC on Tuesday issued a joint statement pausing the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, in the United States. And uh, all uh, 50 states and what? Uh, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, uh, paused the use of the vaccine, as did uh, pharmace uh, pharmacies that were administering the vaccines, and obviously all federally mandated or, or federally uh, run uh, programs as well. Then what happened on Wednesday, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices um, had an open public uh, hearing about this. They reviewed the available data in this emergency, women, uh, er, emergency meeting. There was an additional seven woman who, uh, who came to the attention of that group, as well as a man who received the vaccine during uh, the clinical trials. And it's possible that, uh, that more cases will come to light in the coming days. Now, what happened at that meeting was that the ACIP uh, decided that there was insufficient information to make a recommendation, and they will now reconvene um, on April 23rd. So this has raised questions about uh, the uh, the implications of pausing uh, the use of the J and J vaccine and the messaging that this sends to the public. And I'll come back to that. Um, the real questions are: one, is the vaccine the cause of these severe uh, blood clots? Um, in a in a randomized clinical trial like the phase three trials, it's relatively straightforward to see if the number of new cases of, of something like this are more common in those who receive the vaccine compared to those who do not. But after a vaccine is rolled out and millions and millions of doses are administered, it gets a little bit harder uh, to tell whether or not these events are actually caused by the vaccine or whether they're just happening by coincidence. We know that when you give vaccines to large numbers of people, bad things will happen because bad things just happen to people. Um, and so what the ACIP and other scientists are really trying to figure out is, are these blood clots really caused by the vaccine? And, and so they're gonna be looking at a couple of, of different things. They're gonna look at the background rate. How often uh, do these types of blood clots occur in 
the general population. At the ACIP meeting, the CDC suggested that this is about three times higher than what we would expect. They're going to look at the temporal relationship between vaccination and the uh, and the onset of these. Does that make sense? Um, is there uh, are there alternative explanations? Are these people or individuals who had other reasons to develop severe clotting disorders, maybe because of a, a drug or something they were taking or an underlying disease condition? And lastly, is there a biological mechanism to help explain this? Now, this uh, what's happening with the J&J &J vaccine is not occurring in isolation. This is very similar to what was uh, noted in, in the European region uh, with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And there has been some early work suggesting uh, by scientists in Germany and Norway that perhaps uh, the vaccine is activating uh, or st uh, stimulating the production of antibodies that are activating these platelets. So what's going to happen? Uh, the uh, the ACIP will re-meet on, uh, reconvene on April 22nd, and they're going to review the evidence. It's not clear to me what additional new evidence will have arisen over the past week, um, but they will then and make a decision. It, at one extreme, it could be revoking the emergency use authorization. They could restrict the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to certain subgroups. Maybe it's older adults, as has happened with the AstraZeneca vaccine in Europe. Um, maybe they'll just maintain the emergency use authorization and have a warning. Um, so what are the implications of this? Um, although it's a setback in the United States, um, we have sufficient doses of uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccine to vaccinate all adults who need, the, uh, vac who need to be vaccinated or want to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, this allows for uh, advice to be given to re uh, recipients of the J&J &J vaccine and to educate healthcare providers about this particular uh, potential rare adverse event um, and how to identify it, how to manage it. Um, there are, uh, there's a lot of discussion right now about the potential impacts of this pause on vaccine hesitancy and trust, both in the United States and globally. And I fear that this is going to have the, uh, a, a big impact uh, on global, our global efforts to, to vaccinate and fight this pandemic. So the bottom line, this is the vaccine safety system at work. We do not yet know for sure that the vaccine has caused these, uh, these clots. If it does, if it's if it, they are caused by the vaccine, these are very rare events, about one in a million right now by our estimates, and the benefits of the vaccine still far outweigh uh, the risks. Thanks so much, Bill. Before I turn to questions from our audience, I want to remind everyone who's watching, if you're interested in subscribing to our weekly newsletter, please click on the banner that you see on your screen. This will be delivered to your inbox on Mondays with the latest news about um, COVID data, variants, vaccines, and other critical trends. I'm going to turn now to the questions that we're receiving from our audience. And Bill, for this first question, I want to pick up on something that you just um, touched on at the close of your remarks about what the pause of the J and J vaccine um, means, and and what what does it mean for this so-called race between the variants and getting shots in arms? Yeah, so it, it's it's very important to think about uh, the purpose uh, of of the pause and what the implications are. Um, certainly, the first pause by the FDA and this and the CDC did allow uh, for information to spread to the public. Um, and for uh, healthcare providers to be made aware of what to be looking for and how to manage this. Um, the, uh, but we now are kind of in a second pause period, if you will, as a result of the decision by ACIP to, to wait and, uh, and try to collect more information. I think the, the implications in the race against the virus and the race against the variants are in the United States, in my view, relatively small. I don't want to completely trivialize it because obviously our goal is to get as many people vaccinated as possible um, in order to uh, to fight this pandemic. But you know, the the supply or pipeline of the J and J vaccine was already uh, diminished because of the events that occurred at the Baltimore plant uh, that resulted in uh, the need to destroy uh, some uh, a number of millions of of doses. 
Um, and, and the J&J &J vaccine really has only made up a small proportion, around 4% of all the vaccine used in the United States. And, you know, what, so there, there may be, there will be some kind of temporary delays, I'll say, in people who are scheduled to get the J&J &J vaccine who now cannot get it. Um, but we have enough doses uh, in here in the United States of the Pfizer and Moderna to, I think, fairly rapidly recover from that. Um, again, my concerns uh, are more the implications of what's happened with both the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for our global fight against the pandemic. Thanks so much, Bill. Jennifer, question for you. How do you feel about um, the current classifications that we're hearing of Baltimore City and County as, as hotspots? And and what, what do you think is is driving the numbers? Well, from an epidemiologic standpoint, it's not really a well-defined term, but I think any place where you're seeing a rise in case numbers, a rise in positivity, or worse, hospitalizations or death is reason for concern, in part because of what it could pretend for that area in the coming weeks, um, but also what it could mean for, for other areas. Um, we know that viruses aren't very good at staying put. Um, I think we have to remember that the vast that while we are doing great job at rolling out vaccines in terms of the numbers of, of Americans receiving um, shots in arms each day, um, the vast majority of us are not protected from this virus through a vaccine yet. So there are still big parts of the country, lots of places where there's a lot of vulnerable people. And that is exactly why our public health interventions uh, remain essential. And what, but what we have seen is that many places have lifted all manner of restrictions, um, including I think some of the, the highest, um, the places that I'm most concerned about are the ones that have list, lifted mask requirements, but also places that have lifted um, restrictions on um, indoor venues that we know have been associated with, with increased transmission restaurants and bars. So we have seen that happen here in Baltimore, the restrictions have been lifted and it's not surprising that when you still have vulnerable people that you've, and you, you, um, you know, take your finger off the pause button, the virus is gonna to start to uh, increase um, the number of people that it infects because we need to substitute something else and we haven't yet done enough vaccinations um, for that to have a, um, a slowing effect. Thanks, Jennifer. I have another, another question for you. And um, in some ways, this is a natural follow-up to uh, the piece that you were quoted in, in the Times earlier this week about uh, travel and, and summer summer plan. So the, the question is, what do you see as the prospects for international travel as we head into summer and, and fall, especially thinking about Europe? Yeah, so I think international travel is a bit tricky. Um, in part, uh, it's less, in my view, about um, the risk. If I think if you're vaccinated and um, that makes it much safer, of course, for you to travel. What I worry about is actually um, not fully understanding the trajectories um, that other countries will be on and whether there will be restrictions on, on travel. So um, in my view, I'm thinking if you're planning, you know, summer vacation plans, um, you know, travel to other countries is, is tricky. We don't yet know if there's going to be a proof of immunization required and and, and how you have to document that. And we just don't know what travel restrictions countries will, will put in place. Um, obviously, people can and do still travel internationally. I just think it's, it's a harder situation knowing that um, I think the US, because of its um, aggressive rollout of vaccines, is, is, is looking like it's in a better place than many, many other countries right now. Um, the vaccine uptake has been comparatively slower in Europe. Um, so I think if you're planning travel and you have a choice, probably looking domestically um, may be a better option. Thanks, Jennifer. Bill, I'm I'm seeing a lot of questions come in about boosters, and and of course we've we've heard a lot about that in the last few days. Do you have a sense of what the the rollout for those is is likely to to be like? Will it be is it is it is there enough lead time now that it would be sort of a seamless rollout? Should boosters be needed in a few months? I, th I, I think so. I, I think we can rely on similar systems that we have in place now to get booster doses in. Where, where things may, could get um, complicated or, you know, the, 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 the scenario is going to change, the situation is going to change the United States. We're going to, we're coming up to what I think of as an inflection point where 
we are going to have more doses uh, available than the demand and where the real focus in the United States is going to have to be uh, addressing vaccine he hesitancy and building trust and trying to get those people vaccinated um, who, who at the present time uh, are reluctant to do so. Um, and that's gonna be a longer, more intensive process. We're also gonna see uh, our eligibility criteria uh, expand in the coming months. Uh, we're going to, you know, hopefully uh, before the fall school term, we'll see uh, 12 to, to 16 or 12 to 18 year olds eligible for vaccination. And so that's going to uh, increase the demand. So there will be need to be continued focus uh, on getting uh, first doses and second doses, that primary series, I'll call it, to uh, individuals who are current re currently reluctant or newly eligible. Um, and, you know, we don't want that to kind of uh, be impeded uh, by administration of booster doses. But if that's, if the booster doses are, are going to be needed, let's say, you know, more than six months, six to 12 months from now, and again, I, I think that's rather early, um, I, I think we'll be able to leverage uh, our current systems for vaccine delivery to do that. Thanks, Bill. And I'm seeing a couple of, um, of follow-up questions about when when you think it's reasonable to anticipate that vaccine will be available for those age 12 and older? Yeah, so, um, you know, this is obviously a really important age group to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. Um, the Pfizer uh, has submitted uh, documents to the FDA for an emergency use authorization. I expect we'll hear about that uh, in the coming weeks. I know Moderna has uh, completed their uh, enrollment in their phase three trial. So they're just a, a little bit behind Pfizer in that process. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that maybe by the end, mid to late August, we'll be able to, to vaccinate the 12 to 16 or 12 to 18 year old um, prior to the school year. Thanks, Bill. Jennifer, question for, for you. We're now at a point where we see cases rising in well over half of the states. At least anecdotally, it feels like mask wearing and, and social distancing seem to be uh, lessening as, as folks experience pandemic fatigue. So even with the current push for vaccination, how likely do you think it is that the US will see another, another wave that some would call a third wave, some would call a fourth wave? I'm hopeful that we're going to keep it at the plateauing levels that we see. We may see a bump up further, but I don't think it's going to be anything like the previous waves, just simply because we are um, rolling out vaccines so quickly. Um, but, you know, uh, no, there are no guarantees. Um, so keep wearing your mask and, and keep um, taking measures, <laughs> precautionary measures until you're fully vaccinated. And then, you know, we still need people to, to do those measures even after they're vaccinated because we want to maintain those norms. And I think that's been an important part of this is that even though we feel like we've mentally moved on, the pandemic hasn't. And so uh, reminding ourselves that it's just a while longer that we have to just keep the norms up for, for a bit longer. Thanks, Jennifer. And I see that we are coming up quickly on 1230. So I'm going to wrap this briefing up. I'd like to thank Jennifer Nuzzo and Bill Moss for joining me today and also give a big thank you to everyone who joined us and especially to those who submitted questions for Jennifer and Bill to answer. This briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. As a reminder, we will offer these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. And in each briefing, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic, and we will have live Q&A with our experts. I'll look forward to seeing you at our next 30-minute briefing. Until then, thanks and stay safe.